We're in the company of the Ambassador of Sierra Leone, Her Excellency Miss Yvette Stevens. She's her country's permanent representative to the United Nations in Geneva. It's our intention that by the end of this short interview, we will have shed some light on what the current situation actually is, assess the impact of Ebola and having on various groups in her country, and discuss what needs to be done to win the fight. Your Excellency, thanks for inviting us here today. Can you describe the social and economic impact Ebola's had on the country to date and what industries have suffered the most? Okay. Now, um, Ebola has affected every aspect of our social and economic life in Sierra Leone. In this short period, it has, the impact is already um, serious. First of all, it has the social impacts, including um, health, for instance. We, as you know, after the war, we were experiences, uh, ex we were at the bottom of the ladder in terms of infant and maternal mortality. We had put, on, uh, put forward a program since 2010 to address that free health care to lactating mothers, pregnant mothers and children under five, and we were making much, much progress. In terms of education, schools are closed. They have been closed because of the, of the, of the fear that um, infection could occur in schools. And, and um, so schools are closed for now. Um, when it comes to the economic aspects, I think most remarkable is that economic activities have come to a standstill. In agriculture, people are not able to go to their farms. Um, the mining companies, which is a great source of, that we have developed over the past few years, um, a great source for income for Sierra Leone. Also, many of them have had to scale down or close operations. What effects has the Western world media had on the search for volunteer and professional support to contain and control this epidemic? Well, um, this epidemic actually occurred at a time when the World Humanitarian Committee has been taken by so many events. And this was unfortunate because even though there were um, um, the media was trying to address the Ebola crisis, it did not receive the attention it deserved. I think the humanitarian, World Humanitarian Committee is not known for actually spreading its attention to a number of crises at the same time. So it suffered from that a lot, until now it became apparent that this epidemic is not something that can be easily contained and that the effects, the far-reaching effect on the whole international community is dire. So now we are getting the, 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 the effect that we wanted. We are getting um, um, volunteers um, and the, the international media is continuing its emphasis on the Ebola, on the need to address the Ebola crisis. Your Excellency, has the Catholic Church been instrumental in finding solutions in Sierra Leone to alleviate some of the confusion you told me about? Yes, indeed. And the Catholic Church is well placed because, as you probably know, the Catholic Church has been running clinics, schools, and, um, and now that the Ebola um, crisis has, uh, is, is, is in the country, they have actually done a lot in terms of dispelling myths about the Ebola crisis, about spreading information as to behavior. Um, as one of the priests said, they use the pulpit as advocacy to address problems related to Ebola. Now, the Catholic Church is also looking at quarantine families that have been put at quarantine to provide them with food and basic supplies, and also, of course, the psychosocial support that is required. Um, we see that the Catholic Church can extend its assistance in the areas that it's involved in, including taking care of orphans, and also providing some kind of education whilst this crisis is still on. I see. What's, what's being done currently? Let's, let's look at now. What's being done currently to prevent, to control, and to contain the virus? Yes, well, everything that are in the textbooks are being done right now. Um, we are, first of all, we, we are doing, we are quarantining families, we are doing family in tracing. But as you know, in a situation like in Sierra Leone, in the remote areas, tracing is not an easy thing as you would find in New York, for instance, or you would find in, in, in Dallas. So we, have, we are having the problem of tracing. 
and going back and tracing people. People move a lot. Um, and then, um, so contact tracing, we're still pursuing it. And when we can identify the contacts, they are quarantined. So just clarify that, Ambassador. When you say tracing, you mean to go back and retrace the steps of people yeah. and the contacts they've made. Is that what you mean? Yes, yeah. yes, because that's one important element of addressing the, the, the spread of the disease. Um, once somebody is diagnosed with the disease, what needs to be done is to go and trace all the contacts that the person has have had since the first symptoms of the degree, disease. Now, I mean, as I say, in the West it's easy, but sometimes in our marketplace, you go to the market, you meet so many people, how do you trace? But we are doing our best in terms of where we can identify tracing. Family members in households, that's easy, they are quarantined. But um, again, that is one area which is very important. We are also um, trying to spread information um, awareness because one of the problems that we face with this disease is that there was a delay in responding to it because the populations were actually in denial that this was a disease that needed to be addressed. I mean, there were many allegations. Some people believed it was witchcraft. Some people believed that it was a ploy. But so that, we wasted time on that. So, the public information has become extremely important. And what we did in Sierra Leone, I think there was a lockdown for three days in which there are teams which covered 70% of the households just to go put people down, explain to them what Ebola is, why they need to be quarantined and what they need, the behavior that is expected from them. So mm -hmm. that's another thing. Of course, we, are, we have been working now with, uh, with donors to set up hospital capacity because the problem that we had was that we didn't have enough hospital beds for the people who were being infected and leaving them at home means that more people are being infected. So now we are working towards having a large number of hospital beds. We are moving very fast on that. We have the donors that are assisting us, particularly the UK. We also need the um, 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 medical staff and I think many countries have come in, China, Cuba, um, US and many other countries, African countries too, are coming in, Nigeria, Ethiopia, are now coming in with staff, which is what is the one big need, the hospital space and the, and the personnel to handle the hospital facilities. I see. We're, we're going to come to um, mm -hmm. what the international response has been a little bit later, but I just want to go back to the children, because you mm -hmm. mentioned the children yeah. more than once, and um, to ask you... Uh, uh, what's been currently done for the orphans, for the, for the children that have lost their parents? How do you deal with that on such a scale? It must be mm -hmm. quite difficult. Yes, I think this is a problem which we are now trying to grapple with. As you know, the, the whole Ebola thing is within months only. And now, and now I think there's acknowledgement that there, there are orphan children. Um, many of the children, normally in an African society, I mean, often children would have relatives, would have foster parents. But I think what some of the problems we're facing now is that some of these orphan children, people are afraid to keep them because they say your parents died of Ebola. They, they are afraid that they might also have the disease. So that is a problem. And increasingly, the whole idea of orphanages would have to be considered in terms of looking for after these children. Let's talk a little bit about those who've been fortunate enough to have been um, healed. Um, what's been done to reintegrate them um, into the society they come from? Uh, and, and do you feel that that program is working? There must be some yeah. suspicion yeah. of okay. these people. Tell us a little bit more about uh -huh. that, please. That has been the problem because people who um, survived the disease, they're given a certificate. Say, I am Ebola free. So they have the certificate, they have they're to carry really this very proud. Them, well, yeah. they're very proud that they're, you know, it's, it's amazing to see the people who walk out of the hospitals, how proud they are that they survived and they conquered, as they say, we conquered the Ebola um, um, virus. Um, now, what they have found is that some of people a bit wary of them to say, are you sure? Because when you see a patient who had been sick, take it to the hospital, some, some of them who have survived have been people who have been very sick. So you see them come out and say, now I'm Ebola free. So the, 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 the initial reaction was um, reticence. But I think one big thing that has been done recently, which would help a lot, there was a conference that was organized for survivors. And this, the conference met and the president himself went there 
and they saw that the survivors were being embraced by everybody and that would help a lot to overcome the stigma that they would have amongst the populations. And now that they have also said that they are potential, they, cure, they, they, they carry the blood that could be a potential cure for patients, people now are really <laughs> getting to, 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 to embrace the idea of promoting these, these survivors. So tell us a little bit more about the content of that conference, because that sounds like a very interesting and well, important occasion. I think it was more like, I mean, I don't have the details of what happened in the conference. I think what was more, more important about it was the, was the public awareness that these people were being embraced at the highest level. I can see that. I think that was what was important. I think what they, of course, they, they, they discussed things like, you know, you have to, you know, the potential you have to assist in, in finding a cure for Ebola. Have you been given any glimmer of hope that a cure for Ebola is at hand? I mean, this is the science. Mm -hmm. What's going on behind the scenes in mm -hmm. research and the medical, medical field? Well, um, there is no cure. As far as WHO is concerned, there is no proven cure for Ebola. Um, in the wake of the crisis, there are many drugs at different stage of development that have been pro proposed. And some of these have been tried, as you would imagine, if your alternative is to die or to try a drug that hasn't had 100% success, you probably would opt for trying the drug anyway. So there are many things now, and you, even us sitting here in Geneva, every day somebody comes with a proposed cure that they have. Um, now, what, what, w, what WHO is doing, I mean, they're still using this, trying to use the opportunity now, maybe, to do some early field testing of some of the um, um, drugs that are available, also including the vaccines. But this is very difficult because for WHO, even for the manufacturers, because they say normally we would test this for five years, but now because of the urgency, we have to bring it forward for four. four and the oversight years. of this is WHO. They yes. have the oversight. Yes, the oversight would have to be WHO, although um, they would say the regulatory bodies within the countries themselves have to take responsibility because, as you know, it's very sensitive. Yeah. And when the drugs have not gone through the normal trials, it's a sensitive issue because nobody would want to be held liable for if a drug did not perform. The pharmaceutical companies believe that um, the drugs, for instance, for the vaccines, they have worked in, an, in for instance, one of the vaccines has worked 100% in protecting monkeys. Now, would it have the same level of protection for humans? Nobody knows. But one thing is sure, if we do not have a vaccine, our health workers are catching the disease and dying in the first instance. And if this continues, and we hope to God it doesn't, then um, many people would, many, many more people would require protection from the disease, not only in, in our countries, but outside our countries too. Let's just look um, at the international situation again. As you know, the United States ambassador to the UN, Samantha Power, has criticized the level of international support so far. She's talked about some nations not having taken responsibility yet in supplying aid and doctors and money. But you mentioned other countries that have, or are beginning to, yes. um, step up to that. How do you see the situation as far as international help is concerned? What's your view on the situation? I, I think that the international assistance was slow in coming. I say this because since the month of April, I've been screaming here in Geneva. And as I said, because of all the, these many humanitarian emergencies, probably, and I think that has something to do with it. But, um, and then maybe, I think one thing though, everybody underestimated the severity of this disease. According to WHO, it had occurred before, you know, they can, con they can contain it. And really all the, in, all the, all the cases of Ebola in Africa before had been contained. So I think initially, everybody sat back and said, oh yes, don't worry, they will. What they did not bear in mind is it's, it's the, the peculiarities of this particular outbreak. One, it was a very busy area surrounding three countries. Two, it was, it was in countries that have gone through conflict with, whose health system, as bad as it was, had been worsened. And so they did not have the health infrastructure to cope to contain the viruses. So I think, um, but, but now that it's suddenly become clear that this is serious, 
and has the potential and has been declared, in fact, an international public health emergency and has the potential of spreading to every single country in the world, now we are having a lot of support coming in. That being said, some countries have yet to come in, but every single day we are hearing announcements of help in personnel, in, 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 in finance from different countries. Even some of the smaller countries, the African countries, they are making contribution, modest, but I think what is important about this is the spirit in which it's done. So we are having these and we're having every single day, I would hate to say now to try to fault any country because every single day by the time I get back to my desk we might hear that another country or another country, but now the international community is really gearing up. Um, to address, to assist us to address this. Well, that's very crisis. positive. Mm -hmm. Just in closing, um, if I ask you now to focus on one essential, what is the most essential element, Ambassador, needed to control this epidemic? And what can our viewers and listeners do to help you in your struggle mm -hmm. to fight this global threat? Mm -hmm. I think firstly what is important is to have the, the trained personnel that could handle, trained personnel. Trained personnel that could directly handle the crisis or train Sierra Leoneans to, to work to um, address the, the problem. Um, we also need to have enough hospital beds because it is not enough, it is not good enough that patients cannot be taken into hospital merely because there are not enough beds. So that is something which is critical and um, we now have the, the UK is, 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 is providing a, um, 700 beds that they're now building, the, um, the, 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 the wards. Um, there was a problem too with the health workers too, because that was one thing that was hindering volunteers because the percentage of health workers that have died from Ebola is unprecedented. But now they also need to have facilities that would assure the health workers that are coming from overseas that should they catch the disease, they would be taken care of either by sending them abroad or indeed having facilities within the countries that would cater for their needs. Because unless you have that, many health workers who want to come would hesitate because you're talking about life and death here. So again, these are the things which we need now. We would also later, but these are the immediate things. We need, you know, I say this is like a house is on fire. What we need now is to put out that fire. Once that fire is out, we can look at what caused the fire, what lessons can we learn, and how do we recover from the fire. But for now, a house is on fire. We do not see the fire being put out. And we are very, we, 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 our, our priority is to put out that fire. And what can we do, the ordinary okay. person? I think the ordinary person can do, I think there's still advocacy. I think that there's still, I mean, it's amazing what um, some of, in some countries where people have come together to fundraise, to have recruitment of people, to persuade, to do, you know, really something which could be done would be, would be trying to get the advocacy in, 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 in the international community, in the different countries, of the need to come in and assist these countries, of the need to send, um, um, to send um, health personnel, of the need to send financial resources that are required for this to run the clinics, of the need to send materials that are required for, to, 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 to tackle the disease. And I think that a lot can be done in that regard. We do not, I do not think we have reached the, mark, the peak of that yet. For instance, within Switzerland here, I do not see people in the street that are so aware. I think a lot more could be done, even right here in Geneva, in terms of creating the awareness that would lead to positive support in terms of personnel, in terms of finance, in terms of materials. Ambassador, you've communicated your sense of urgency. Thank you for your time. We wish you well and your compatriots um, a happy ending to this very difficult time. Yes, and thank you very much. And thank you so much for your interest. And through you, the Catholic Church, too, for the way it's assisting us. Thank you. Thank you.